has this talk and to people who are maybe not quite so outside. Yeah, I do quite a bit of speaking actually in, in colleges and schools. Um, work with Born Free on that as well as the Family Trust. We work with the Discovery Channel this year, we're planning some more work with National Geographic, for example, next year. Um, and whenever I go into schools, it, it does have a significant impact. You know, often I speak to primary school children, you play video footage of badgers playing, you know, we've got some wonderful footage, and it really inspires them. Um, if you talk to older children, you're trying to explain about some of the economic and political issues, and they are genuinely interested in that. And often I go into both public and secondary schools talking to, to teenagers and getting them to put their iPhones and their iPads down and listen is not easy, but often teachers have said to me, when you've gone in, you have really woken them up and made them speak, and then they're talking about it in the classroom afterwards. So we do need to do more of that. Equally, I'm spending an increasing amount of time going into agriculture colleges as well, for example, where farmers are being trained, where veterinary nurses are being trained, where people who go into animal welfare-related activities are learning their skills, because we need to talk to them as well. But I think often NGOs and charities that are engaged in this sort of frontline <coughs> fight to protect wildlife don't understand the importance of speaking to the next generation. We do need to do it. But we've got to put the resource and time into it. Personally, I feel it's something terribly important. But you're right, we, we need to do more of it. And why do you think the NGOs that you mentioned are not uh, involved with these? I think it seems politically toxic. You know, and it's sensitive. You know, when I write in the book about some of the problems I've had with the NFU and legal issues because of some of the statements I've made in the press and media. Um, you know, they have relationships with ministers and officials across a broad range of activities. And, and if you, you probably they think, well, we don't really want to endanger that by getting involved in this badge of public issue. It's a shame. Because I went back 20, 30 years, WWF and other organizations were involved with it. I write in the book about what started a number of those organizations off like Greenpeace. So for example, when Greenpeace set up in the early 70s in this country, the first thing it did was take Rainbow Warrior, their ship, and send it to the Shetland Islands to stop the Labour government of Jim Callaghan bringing in large numbers of shooters to kill seals in the Shetlands to protect fisheries. That was a very effective campaign <coughs> in you know, mobilized individuals to go on the beaches. The ship went up there with a lot of coverage. And to me, that's just the type of thing that Greenpeace should be doing for badgers today. There's no different. What was the difference between the 1970s and today? Well, it's grown into almost a multinational organization. To a degree, it's compromised itself into a corner. It does good work. But everything has to be looked at through the prism of all of these relationships, complex relationships that it has. And that means it's much more careful about what it says and what it does. And that's a shame. Because at the end of the day, when people give it money, they really believe that they will stand up for these issues. And to me, that's terribly important. It needs to happen. I hope that the chapter in this book on the NGOs, which is probably one of the most controversial, it was published in the I newspaper and things, which was great, has probably had the most impact. And I hope that debate goes on because I hope those organizations will rethink their positions. And even if they don't go forward directly themselves, there's nothing stopping them funding smaller charities like the Badger Trust by supporting projects or you know, League Games for Sports and other organizations and nothing. Nothing at all. Would you agree that an important way to, uh, to uh, reduce TV impact and therefore prevent uh, badges would be to reduce the cattle industry? Yes, I, I, you know, there's two debates. You can stop drinking milk. Many people in this audience won't drink milk or consume meat. That's a perfectly legitimate argument. But we also have to accept that over 90% of the population do and probably are likely to do for quite a considerable time. Do we try and change the nature of farming? Yes. I feel sorry for farmers. I'm not anti-farmer in this book because many livestock and dairy farmers are under a lot of pressure anyway. And when they're going to shut down as a result of TV, it has massive social economic impact on them. But the problem is that the retailers have forced the price of those products down so low. So for example, milk sells cheaper in supermarkets today than bottled water and Coca-Cola and products like that. So on average, the farmer's been producing milk at 20p a litre. <coughs> uh, 30p a litre, sorry, and the retailers might only just be paying over 20p for it. So you, that's not sustainable. And what happens is the farmers then have to move cattle and sell and trade parts to make money to supplement their income. That spreads the disease as well. Less cows, better welfare, less spread of the disease, stop to the live animal export side of things. They would be significant improvements to get control of it, most definitely. Is it only the livestock farmers which are persecuting badgers today or any other types of farmers? We have problems particularly with the hunts and, and landowners who you know, have shooting estates and other things because they obviously see the badger as a sort of predator, a significant predator, one of the few large predators left in our natural environment today. And you know, to them, it's convenient just to get rid of it completely. And I think under the 
the sort of cover of badger culling, there's been large concerns that licenses have been issued in areas where there's not much agriculture farming going on, but there's been a significant shooting estate interest, so they're just getting involved in cutting the badgers down as well. And equally, there's concerns that a lot of property developers would like to get rid of badgers, so it's convenient for them to say, let's just kill these animals as well. Is there any uh, ecological proven uh, benefits to, um, to badgers? You know, the, you know, the badger is one of the large, largest remaining predators because we don't have wolves and bears any longer. Um, have their numbers increased? Yes, they have since protection, but 50,000 a year probably get killed on our roads. If it's a very dry spring, for example, the cubs will find it hard to find earthworms, so they will die. There's disease outbreaks. We have culling that's killed 10,000 plus now. We have illegal persecution that's killing thousands every year. So they're under threat from many different factors. Um, this idea that the budget population is exploding and it's going to kill everything. And also the hedgehog debate is a bit of a, 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 a political argument that people use. Yes, badgers will predate on hedgehogs because they compete for the same food source. If a badger comes across a hedgehog, it might kill it. But the vast majority decline in hedgehogs is due to pesticide use, hedgerow removal, the way that we fence in our gardens to roadkill, to the use of streamers. All those factors, slug pellets, are killing a massive rate of hedgehogs. It's not badgers that are taking them down. So the figures where we've got less than a million probably of population left in this country. Well, thank you very much. As I said, I have copies of the book here. I publish a Martins at the back there as well. Um, so if anyone wants to take a copy of the book and sign one today, uh, we're able to sell them today at nine pounds each. They are worth reading, um, and you know they are a good book to, to take away and to share with other people as well, and really pass that message on. But thank you very much. Thank you.